नमस्कार हेलो एंड वेलकम व्यूअर्स यू वाचिंग द स्पेशल प्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ संसद टीवी बातचीत वेयर एन ऑनरेबल मेंबर ऑफ पार्लियामेंट विल इंटरव्यू ऑनरेबल यूनियन मिनिस्टर एंड जॉइनिंग अस टुडे आर टू वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट्स प्लीज वेलकम एक्सटर्नल अफेयर्स मिनिस्टर ऑफ द कंट्री डॉक्टर एस जय शंकर वेलकम सर ही इज अ मेंबर ऑफ द अपर हाउस ऑफ पार्लियामेंट फ्रॉम द स्टेट ऑफ गुजरात ही वाज फॉरेन सेक्रेटरी फ्रॉम 2015 टू 2018 30th मई 2019 Dr S J Shankar was Dr. sworn in as a cabinet minister Jay in the Shankar. second term of the Modi government. I I Subramaniam Jay Shankar do swear in the name of God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the constitution of India as by law established and I will uphold the sovereignty and integrity of India. that i will faithfully and conscientiously discharge my duties as a minister of for the union and that i will do right to all manner of people in accordance with the constitution and the law without fear or favor affection or ill will he was made the minister of external affairs on 31st of may 2019 He is the first former foreign secretary to head the Ministry of External Affairs as the cabinet minister and second ever diplomat to be appointed as India's external affairs minister after Natwar Singh. Joining the Indian Foreign Service in 1977, Dr. Jay Shankar has represented India's interests and fostered friendly working relationships in countries around the world. He has been the longest serving Indian ambassador to China. He has also served in other diplomatic assignments in embassies in Moscow, Colombo, Budapest, Tokyo, as well as in the Ministry of External Affairs and the President Secretariat. He also served as President Global Corporate Affairs at Tata Sons Private Limited in 2018. Dr. Jay Shankar is a graduate of St. Stephen's College at the University of Delhi. He has a master's in political science. and an MPhil and PhD in international relations from Jawaharlal Nehru University for the career diplomat turned politician who was inducted into the union cabinet this is the second term in the rajya sabha for him dot s jashankar delighted to have you on sansa tv very happy to be here let's also welcome dr sasmit patra bjd mp he is also leader of the biju janata dal parliamentary party in the rajya sabha from effectively raising issues of regional and national importance in parliament to firmly advocating india's stance at global forums dr sasmit patra has utilized every opportunity to focus on legislative deliberative and developmental roles since 28th of june 2019 he is a member of the parliament of india representing the state of odisha in the upper house and was appointed as the chief whip of the party mm-hmm. Sasmit Patra He is currently spokesperson of the Biju Janata Dal. He was re-nominated to the upper house by Biju Janata Dal for the second time in May 2022. Dr. Patra, glad to have you on Sansa TV. Over to you. Let's get ready for this very meaningful conversation between the honorable minister and honorable parliamentarian. Dr. Patra. We are privileged to have with us Dr S J Shankar the foreign minister of the world's largest democracy India so welcome and it's a privilege and a personal honor for me to be across the table and have a conversation with you so when we look at India in the last 9 years of prime minister Modi's administration we see that the foreign policy has changed something different has happened some transformation has happened what is this transformation which signifies the administration of PM Modi uh well uh, let me explain that uh, at some length but before i do that i want to say dr patra that you know you and i often talk in the house uh, in the central hall and it's very good today that we are talking in front of the camera uh, i think in a way it tells a lot of people how uh, members of parliament relate to each other and uh, you know how how we look at the world uh, uh, from our respective perspectives so you asked me uh, saying really uh something has changed what has changed i would say 
uh, perhaps the biggest change is the, uh, is the sense from Prime Minister Modi himself that foreign policy must be an instrument today uh, to accelerate national progress and development. Now, it is not like people previous governments did not do that before, but the focus, the passion, uh, the understanding that he has brought to it, the directness that he has brought to it is very much more. So, if you look actually at the last 9 years, you actually have you know projects like the bullet train collaboration with Japan, right. uh, you have some of the water technologies for example, with uh, some of the European countries with uh, Israel, uh, you have environmental technologies with the Nordics. Uh, we just had a big semiconductor uh, uh, set of understandings with the United States. So, how do you go abroad, uh, assess and appreciate technology? Uh, also, how do you attract capital? Uh, how do you uh, how do you absorb best practices? So, I I actually joke with people saying there's a Modi brand of tourism. Okay. That you know the people you know people ask you saying okay after your program what do you do? Right. Okay. So, uh, the Modi brand of tourism is really go out there and see what is useful, what is relevant, what is a new learning, what is it you can take back to your country as a way of uh, you know uh, getting ahead. So, that is that is one. The second uh, in a way is uh, it is a very I would say people focused outlook, it is a people right. focused outlook within the country that is a different subject. But uh, why I mention people focus outlook is uh, I think Prime Minister keeps dinning it into us. This is a globalized world. There are today three and a half crore uh, Indians and people of Indian origin who live abroad. Uh, and a uh, lot of them work, a lot of them have settled down. Uh, the country benefits from it in many ways, uh, not just remittances, but in a variety of ways. True. I mean, we today look at a global workplace. Right. Now, how do you run a foreign policy for that? Uh, running a foreign policy for that really means if they get into trouble, uh, for example, how do you quickly replace a passport? Right. Uh, they get into more trouble, cannot afford to deal with it, how do you have funds to support them? Uh, how do you make sure your embassies and consulates respond on a Saturday, Sunday or in the middle of a night? How do you look after uh, you know, people, especially those whose uh, knowledge and you know confidence levels may not be that high say blue collar workers true what are the arrangements you make for them and we saw during covid or we saw during these operations like uh, ganga and kaveri uh, you know if your students are stuck in ukraine or your workers are stuck in sudan how do you then put in place an sop so that the indian system is there and they go out confidently in the world saying okay the government has our back so that's that is the second part of it. The third part of it is actually traditional foreign policy. You know, uh, foreign policy is a contest, it is a competition. Uh, any country which is rising, like we are doing, uh, it will, there is a Newton's uh, third law of international relations. For every rise, there is an equal and opposite resistance. Right. So, there will be some who will help you, uh, but there will be many countries who will uh, find ways of slowing you down. So, how do you maneuver through this space? you know and, and that is not something which is so easily uh, done. Uh, the fourth aspect is really you know it is not just a globalized world, it is also a single planet. So, these the big issues of the planet you know uh, climate change uh, uh, or uh, you can say even issues like terrorism, uh, how do we how do we cooperate. And finally, I would say you know Mr. Modi in many ways has a certain vision not just of government and foreign policy, I would say even of country. He has a certain historic sense, I mean we are uh, you know uh, at least a 5000 year civilization, uh, again uh, rising in the international order uh, as, a, as a nation state today. So, how do we set in place policies, practices? Uh, so. Uh, how do we make sure the rest of the world uh, appreciates our culture, our traditions, our history? How do you familiarize them True. with it? Uh, how do we become the mainstream? Right. You know right. that that. So I think all these today have combined to create uh, 
a, a different narrative and there is nobody better than Prime Minister Modi really to uh, to radiate that narrative you know when he gets up there on the global stage. True. I, I think you get that sense India has changed. How wonderful Dr. Jay Shankar about the four or five pieces that you spoke about it's really unique the way India has transformed under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi and under your able guidance as the foreign minister. One specific area about the Indian diaspora you spoke about three and a half crore Indian diaspora abroad we find an infectious energy when you actually see the Prime Minister and you walking down the streets and there's so much of galvanization of support and you know Indian flags flying. How has that happened? There's so much of Indianness that we see on the foreign lands, on the foreign streets. How does it reflect on you? What does it talk about the global India to you? Uh, you know, I was there at the inflection point, which was the Madison Square Garden event in 2014. If you remember, I was at that time the yes. ambassador. Uh, and I had actually come into Delhi uh, soon after uh, Prime Minister Modi assumed office. And we started planning the America visit. And uh, he started, you know, he brought up the subject of diaspora. And he said, you know, we should think bigger. And normally, we do a few hundreds, OK? So for us, thinking bigger is a few more hundreds, right? OK? I mean, it had never crossed anybody's mind to to go bigger than that. And uh, he he sort of was very uh, very clear. I mean, and I still remember his saying that, "Jo bhi aap New York mein karengi, uski awaz sabse pehle Washington tak pahunchni chahiye, aur uske baad it must reverberate around the world." How wonderful! Hmm? So the, it was a challenge for us, you know, because. Uh, one thing is to do what you've been doing better, maybe bigger. This was a totally different league. Different. Okay. And uh, you know, uh, I don't say this to you as an event. What it did was it told the diaspora that look, here is a prime minister, here is a country, here is a government. They value you. You mean something to them. And you know, and then you know, he started in uh, Madison Square Garden. Then it went to Australia. I was not on that trip. I was still in the U.S. as ambassador. And I remember the one in Wembley with the next year, yeah, because that was almost, I think, seventy-five thousand people. Wow. Okay. And he said something out there which resonates even today with with the diaspora, which was, you know, he did that very typical. He said, "Ye." Ye passport ka rishta nahi hai, ye khun ka rishta hai. So, that sense of you know emotion, attachment, value, uh, that is really what has energized the diaspora. So, what we have seen is their willingness today to do things. You know, I, I, I must tell you, I have this huge tailwind today in the foreign policy. Wherever I go, it does not have to be United States, does not have to be UK. You know, I was in Papua New Guinea with PM for the Pacific visit. Yeah. And even in Papua New Guinea, influential Indians who were there came and said, look, what can we do, you know, Beautiful. to to, uh, to strengthen this relationship. So, uh, it is, I, you know, uh, we actually in a way had a very, I would not say casual attitude, but a very uh, detached attitude towards people who went abroad and and in fact many of them felt it you know right. i mean the joke among them was that till modi came nri meant not required india oh, okay huh? so it changed you know once because they they personally felt from modi that look this man puts a value on us he is proud of our success and that then makes them want to to be more attached to us. How wonderful, Dr. Jay Shankar. Really profound insights that we are getting from you. One of the key areas that we find, especially after you became the foreign minister, you, it was almost baptism by fire with you. You came in COVID-19 pandemic, then the Ukraine-Russia, then various international issues are happening one after another. Despite all of this uncertainty in the global scenario, India is emerging stronger. India is emerging more powerful. India is taking a lead on the high tables of international diplomacy. How did this happen? And what are the reasons that you feel that led to it, especially you as the foreign minister? Uh, 
Uh, well, I will start uh, with the least important and work my way up if you will. Uh, for me, it was not it was a baptism by fire as a minister, but it was not a baptism by fire for the subject you know. So, I mean having done four decades, I was sure. comfortable in the domain. Okay. Right. Now, if I move up the order of importance, uh, then you have a situation you are absolutely right. I mean if you look at it, uh, we had uh, 2019, uh, we had the article 370 issue, after that we had the you know uh, uh, by the uh, end of the year, the COVID uh, concerns which started. Uh, then we had the Chinese uh, on the LAC, uh, uh, then the COVID in full flow, uh, the Vande Bharat uh, mission, uh, the oxygen crisis, the uh, vaccine um, uh, maitri, even in fact one part of it is even getting the ingredients for vaccine manufacturing sure. in India. So, and then we had uh, the Ukraine, then we had Sudan. So, so it is you are right, I mean it is it is been a succession of that. But uh, even if you are comfortable in the domain, uh, I think what helped me very much when I became minister had to deal with it was uh, 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 the comfort and the experience of working with the prime minister. Uh, because all said and done foreign policy is a domain where the prime minister has a very direct uh, lead and inspiration and in many ways understandably an oversight. So, because I had worked with him from 2015 that made it easier, uh, but more than that I would say I was enormously helped by both the in a way the kind of vision and attitude of the prime minister and his working style. So, what do I mean by that? Uh, by vision I meant that he takes you know he takes a lot of interest in the world he follows things a lot he you know every time we meet or he, we have regular briefings interactions because he understood the complications of this world we are sliding into a more competitive world one where you know globalization today is very questionable uh, many ways a very polarized world under great financial stress trade disruption climate action terrorism so i mean you have layer after layer so, one was if you have a PM who has that understanding appreciation and therefore, thinks that through. The second was through the COVID period, you know every time we would in fact, we have we would meet as a cabinet or in small groups. His point was look, we are not going to hunker down during COVID. Right. You know, which may most countries most did. Countries, you know, yes. they kind of shut, they closed the shutters and said, "Okay, we'll come out after COVID." His his uh, uh, view was: Look, this is a time to reflect, review, reform. Let's do big changes. Let's not come out of the COVID in a defensive manner. You know, bruised and battered. Let's come out. What are the things we should do so that we come out of it much more confident? So, if you look. Uh, for example, on the economic side, uh, you put in place a whole lot of reforms, including you know the whole changing, recapitalizing the banks. We came out with a much he healthier financial situation. We created an enormous social welfare system during COVID by feeding you know 80 crore people and by doing jandhan payments to 40 crore people. Uh, we actually created a new digital society during COVID. So. Now, you would say why is that relevant to foreign policy? It is relevant today because when I go out today, a lot of the world asks me saying is it true you did that? How does this work? Please tell us you know. So, it has got us a lot of in a sense of respect, but there is also his working style. His working style is very much you know uh, define the challenge, set it in context, give me the pros and cons, let us all debate it you know let us ask others who are relevant to it, but then you get clarity, you get a decision, you get a mandate. So, in a sense today as foreign minister, uh, you know I, I it is very difficult for me to guess what other foreign ministers go through, but I can at least say I have great clarity on my instructions, on my mandate, on the vision of my prime minister of where my government is going. That gives me a lot of tactical, tactical flexibility uh, in in uh, operating in the world. How wonderful Dr. Jayashankar. Uh, 
I would like to take you to a couple of specific questions. I mean, we have talked about the larger picture. G20 presidency, mm -hmm. India is taking the lead. September, the world is arriving in New Delhi for the large summit. And as the foreign minister, you have a major responsibility there to play a part in terms of the entire G20. Over the last one year, how has India's uh, perception transformed and grown because of the G20 presidency? And going forward, how is this G20 presidency, this experience, going to help us at the international frame? Well, you know, um, the G20 today faces a double problem. One is a north-south problem, hmm? north-south in terms of development. Huh? So you would have, you know, the, as in Hindi, the Vixit days, the Vikasil days, and the problems are of growth, of development, of debt, of health, of uh, sustainable development goals, uh, uh, of shrinking resources, of mounting pressures. So this is one problem. The other problem is the east-west problem. You know, east-west problem. Uh, made very sharp by the Ukraine conflict, but that is not the only problem. I mean, there are other issues in the East West. So, our responsibility today, certainly as the G20 presidency, uh, but I would say beyond that, is how do we find a kind of create not just a consensus, but a solution in a way to, to uh, these issues. Now, bear in mind the fundamental, the basic remit of the G20 is really to promote global growth and development. Uh, the G20 is not the UN Security Council. It is, it is, its primary responsibility is not to deal with international peace and security, but international peace and security can affect growth and development, right. as we are saying. Very true. Hmm? So, uh, how do we get the balance right? How do we carry the players? How do we find a common landing ground? Uh, so, some of it is diplomacy, some of it is still under progress, but some of it is also, you know, there are broadly about 15 streams which feed today into, I mean, G20 is uh, today uh, 200 meetings, about 15 ministerials, pretty much all the interconnected aspects of growth and development um, are covered by the G20. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, to, you know, what we do in G20 in energy, let us say will feed into COP28. What we do in G20 in terms of sustainable development will feed into the SDG summit uh, which is going to take place next month. What we do on the finance track will be absolutely crucial for the future of the multilateral development banks. So, I want you to understand, I would like the, uh, you know, the viewers also to appreciate. This is not a one year exercise and just a set of meetings and then say, okay, we have now arrived at a package. Right. This is a hugely consequential body whose decisions and whose directions and whose debates will actually set the tone for pretty much everything big, which is going to happen in the coming years, possibly in the coming, coming decades. So, uh, we have to work really a whole set of issues, then integrate it into a package and then uh, you know have the approval of the leaders uh, when they come. So, that is one part of it. The other part of it uh, which I think has made our G20 presidency very unique uh, and this is again something I would say in all honesty I, I attribute it to the prime minister personally. His sense was look you know you people in the foreign ministry you think international diplomacy means a conference center in Delhi. Right. Okay. That is the old way of doing it. That is the you know, that is a bureau, like an official way of doing it. You know, I want to do it in a way in which the entire country feels we have stakes in G20, right. because it is it's such a big responsibility. And this should also uh, give an opportunity for the world to get to know India. So, uh, I use this phrase saying, look, the purpose, the, the whole G20 exercise, we'd, if you are doing 60 cities, if you are doing every state and union territory, the reason we are doing it is we want in a sense the world to be as you say India ready, to understand India, to know India. These are the most influential people in the world. Right. Okay. If these people have a better sense, you know, if they go to uh, Puri and Katak, you know, for them today they will put Orissa in a visual 
Very which true. they would not have been. Very true. You know. And similarly, for the people of, you could say, uh, whether it is Srinagar or Coimbatore, or wherever you know it is happening, they would have a sense also of what does it mean to have the world come into. Right. You know, and I've been very. I must tell you, I've been hugely impressed by the enthusiasm uh, with which every government, you know, and this is not a political point. You know. I would say some of the most enthusiastic governments are those which are ruled by non BJP parties, uh, non NDA parties. Hmm? And I think everybody is really given their best uh, to this. So, we have done a great job so far, we still have a few months to go, uh, but I am really proud that we have been able to make this into a truly national endeavor. How wonderful, Dr. Jay Shankar. In fact, these insights will help us and our viewers to better appreciate G20 because we look at it in a top-down approach. But the synergy and the spoken hub approach that you have provided about G20 will really help us to appreciate it better. I'd like to come to a specific aspect about Indo-US relations. Sure. Uh, very recently, the Honorable Prime Minister was there, you were there, and many such issues took place, many discussions happened. Uh, Honorable Prime Minister is probably the only Prime Minister who has addressed the U.S. Congress twice. Yes. And, and it only is Indian Prime Minister. Yes. Only, only Indian Prime Minister who has done that. Now, in the context of that and looking at Indo-U.S. relations, in the nine years we've seen a substantial transformation, mm -hmm. a kind of bonding because initially in the uh, Cold War era, so to say, we were not really great friends. But in the last nine years, we have seen a tremendous amount of synergy emanating from both sides, relating to cross-border terrorism, relating to trade and commerce, uh, science, uh, energy. What has really transformed and how has this happened? And what are the uh, takeaways from such a relationship that has been built by the Honorable Prime Minister and you as the Foreign Minister? You know, uh, uh, probably of all the important relationships that we have, uh, the one I happen to be most closely associated with for a long period of time is that with the US. Uh, the first visit that I worked on, I did not go for it, but I worked on it was Indira Gandhi's visit in 1982. Uh, so, from there till this visit, uh, I mean I would have obviously missed a few, but uh, uh, when I reflect uh, about those 40 years, I would say till now we would have said that the three big visits, uh, impactful visits were uh, Modi in 2014, Dr. Manmohan Singh in 20, 2005, uh, the nuclear deal visit uh, and perhaps the Rajiv Gandhi visit in 1985. Uh, because he was trying to put that Cold War suspicion uh, behind us. So, these would be like in a sense the benchmarks if you would. When I look at this visit, I mean this was clearly way above and, and I will tell you why, it is a very very objective uh, uh, sort of conclusion which I am putting to you. One, we came out in a sense out of the negative zone. If you look at all the earlier visits, it was you know we and the US wanted to go forward, but there is obstacle A, there is obstacle B, there is obstacle C. So, all your attention is how do I remove this, how do I deal with this, how do I build trust, how do I get you to like me, but we are still not ready to do serious things together. Right. This visit was that. So, if you look actually at the outcomes of it, you know, uh, the uh, say, uh, I'm I'm using a few examples. Sure. One big outcome was the jet engine, uh, the G414 uh, understanding. Now, uh, you know, you it will probably surprise you. We first raised the G engine issue in 1986. You know, that was when we made that first request. I have a picture of me as the youngest and the least relevant guy in a group <laughs> with Dr. Kalam among other people in a delegation. Dr. Arunachalam led that delegation. 
where we actually went to the US in 1986 saying, you know, why don't we you look Get at them. this? And the reason why it didn't happen for 40 years is because very few countries part with jet engine technology. Mm. Jet engine technology is like the crown jewels of, a, of defense industry. Very you know, because it's got so much uh, technology concentrated in it. So you've got to understand what a big jump today the relationship has made. Let me give you a second example. Today, the, the big issue is semiconductors. It's the chips, you know, you Absolutely. see this, you would have right. seen that book, Chips War and so on. Now, this time we actually had three agreements done. And by the way, one has already started to find its way on the ground, the Micron one. So between Micron, Applied Materials and Lamb Research, who are really like the, the brand names of that industry, you know. For them actually to say, yes, you know, we are convinced India is a good partner, the business conditions in India are right, the political uh, comfort is there. So, so you actually had outcomes. And my sense is, you know, for a long time, American business was very distrustful of India. Right. This time we saw something very different, you know, from Elon Musk to Tim Cook, uh, new industry, old industry, GE, Boeing. Hmm? And the the point you refer to, the uh, the address to the Congress. Look, the address to the Congress actually is a statement of American, it's an American political assessment True. of which leaders today, you know, are central to American thinking. So, uh, in a way, the invitation itself is a statement. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's a bipartisan statement. Because you have, remember, the president today is a Democrat, the speaker is a Republican. Republican yeah. So, so I, I think there is a lot in this visit. Uh, my, my honest sense is it has really taken our relationship into a much uh, higher orbit. And if I, if I can come back to my first point, which was how does foreign policy today serve national progress? I think you, this visit has done a lot uh, today you will see practical things which will help the Indian economy uh, and in many ways directly contribute to areas like employment. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Jay Shankar. I mean, we would have loved the conversation to go on and on. It's, it's so wonderful listening to you. You get so immersed with your wide, I mean, you know, wisdom, knowledge and the depth of understanding that you bring. But alas, time is passing away. And we have to close our conversation today for another day when we'll take up more such conversations. Thank you so much for your time. It was a privilege listening to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. I, I also enjoyed talking to you and I think we'll have to carry this on in the Central Hall. We should, sure, huh? sir. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. So the two of you can continue this conversation in the Central Hall. But Dr. Patra, thank you so much for bowling those wonderful questions. And of course, Dr. S. J. Shankar, thank you so much for batting those brilliant answers and giving us that perspective on India's foreign policy. Thank you. Well, viewers, that's all we have for you in this edition. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Sunset TV. Goodbye for now from our side.